thank you all. Uh, this this uh, today's talk uh, on uh, Gorka campaign uh, under this by Martin Sautari BNC lecture series. Uh, uh, this is the second lecture uh, on the theme. Uh, I'm basically speaking on Gorkhas today uh, 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 to honor my friend, uh, Dr. Chandra Lakzamba, who is my teacher on this field too. Uh, we worked together for many years and sadly he passed away uh, of COVID this January. So I'd like to dedicate this lecture to, uh, to him. I'm, I'm also inspired to uh, uh, present something on Gorkhas, you know, the big project that he started. Uh, I must make it very clear that I'm not a military expert. I'm not a pension expert as well. Uh, and my aim today is basically to highlight and describe the ongoing campaigns uh, that I have observed for over uh, 10 years in the UK. Uh, and I'm not aiming to making, you know, theorize, doing any theorization or any, anything. Uh, the context, uh, a, uh, uh, I mean, my, my work is basically informed by a series of research we have carried out from Center for Nepal Studies UK, along with the uh, uh, colleague Chandra Lagzamba uh, and all the people like uh, the Lokendra Guru Stakal, uh, David Gellner. Uh, some of the uh, reports uh, which you can see here in the screen were written together with them. So I'm also uh, using some of the materials uh, that we produced together. So I would like to acknowledge that. The context of the, today's presentation is basically uh, the British Gurkhas, uh, who mo most of the who are, are uh, stationed in the UK, uh, are continuing with the uh, campaigns uh, for justice and equality. Uh, there was one uh, Satyagraha hunger strike uh, slotted to be stays from the 1st of July. Uh, and there were uh, a series of uh, protests uh, uh, in London, uh, one on the uh, 15th of June, uh, including asking British government to donate vaccines to Nepal. Uh, and then one was organized on the 1st of July. So it is the, it, in this context that I would like to hi highlight why the Gurkhas are hesitating. Uh, I've got uh, so many slides here, the old slides. Uh, I will skip uh, because uh, it might take a lot of time uh, uh, as necessary, but we can discuss. Uh, I, I, I would welcome uh, for feedback, uh, questions and discussions after uh, the talk. Uh, I don't want to uh, go much into detail of the history because uh, I think many of us here today are aware of the Gurkhas, uh, the histories. You know, Gurkha recruitment started in 1815, uh, following the Anglo Nepal War of the 1814, uh, 1816. And Nepal's bigger participation uh, was basically as a kind of the you know, um, event that proved Nepal's uh, loyalty to British was the mutiny of 1857 when Nepal's Prime Minister Zangabadu himself led uh, Nepali uh, uh, army. And uh, as a result of that, Nepal managed to get uh, a new uh, Nayamuluk, uh, the land known as Nayamuluk that Nepal had lost early in the Anglo-Nepal war. Uh, then, uh, uh, in 1947, the Gurkhas serving in uh, uh, India uh, were divided into British and Indian Army. Uh, there have there been a lot written about the uh, Gurkha histories with a recent fantastic book by Tim I. Guru. Uh, uh, basically, Nepalese as a Gurkhas participated in both world wars in a huge number, uh, more than 2% of 4% of Nepal's population join uh, these world wars uh, on the side of uh, British. Uh, there's a, a large number of them uh, lost their lives. Uh, conservative estimate shows that you know, around 43,000 people lost their life. 150,000 people were injured. Many disappeared without any trace, uh, disability, trauma, uh, and the whole you know, generation of Nepalese young you know, of that category was wiped out. Uh, 
uh, uh, Nepalese also managed to receive the, the highest honor in the British military. Now, the, in the, in the Gorkhas were uh, allowed to receive that medal since 1911, I think. Uh, and since then, you know, out of 26 medals, uh, 20, uh, 13 were awarded to Gorkhas. And we have one surviving uh, Victoria Cross holder, Ramba Dulimbu, who is in Nepal and has been supporting Gurkha um, uh, campaigns for equality and justice. Uh, 1947, uh, when India gained independence from Britain, uh, Britain wanted to keep uh, some of the Gurkhas. So out of 10 regiments, four of them were taken by uh, Britain, but they were stationed in the far, far east in the places like Malia and Borneo. Uh, and the uh, six remain in Indian Army. And this was governed by the so-called uh, instrument, uh, so-called tripartite agreement. I'll uh, dis discuss a little bit about them later. And Gurkhas uh, have been participating in all battlefields that uh, in the interest of Britain, they need to protect the British crown and the people and they continue to be uh, deemed as brave and uh, with the great loss of lives and uh, suffering. Uh, just to give an give a overview, this is a bit old data of the 2013. Uh, I mean, there's a great discrepancy among the data as we, you know, every time we request for data, uh, something different comes out. But this gives us a, a, a tentative overview of the table with Gurkhas. Uh, the Gurkhas can be divided into three parts, one with no pensions, there's a large number of Gurkhas uh, who fought in Second World War uh, in, in 2013, estimated to be 500,000 still surviving. Uh, maybe most of them died by now uh, without any pensions. And there were the people who uh, served between 1948 and 1975. There's a large group who were made redundant, uh, forced to leave the army once the battle, the battle they fought was over. So that means like they didn't have any entitlements without pensions. And the biggest bulk of the Gurkhas is the ones called GPS holder, which are the Gurkha pension scheme holder. The Gurkha pension scheme is the crux of the, all these debates, uh, divisions, discriminations. Uh, I'll be discussing more on this one later. And they are the serving Gurkhas. Uh, their number fluctuates depending on the, how much the Britain wants to have them. Uh, uh, for example, uh, after the economic crisis in 2008, Britain started to cut down their military forces and they also downsized Gurkhas uh, from 3,500 to, to, to uh, uh, below 3,000. 3, but uh, in Britain, the native uh, born British, there is not much interest to serve in the army. So there is in a way, I think the uh, shortages so Britain started to recruit uh, Commonwealth soldiers in 1998, and also they increased the number of uh, Gurkhas beyond the quotas. I think uh, more or less in average terms, 200, 250 uh, Gurkhas are recruited, of, of whom uh, 100 are sent as a Singapore police, uh, but that number uh, fluctuates. Uh, so I think to make up some of the shortages in the, in the uh, native British, but they recruited more people. Now there is, you know, on one January there were more than 3,700 3, Gurkhas. Uh, to present the Gurkha campaigns, I have divided this camp, these camps in the three parts. One first part is the, covers the period between 1990 and 2003. Uh, and uh, uh, in this period, one of the biggest. Uh, uh, development was the transfer of, of Gurkhas, uh, ne Nepalese Gurkhas, who were stationed in the Far East, uh, i.e. Hong Kong. Uh, uh, they were transferred to UK with the base in Aldersat and some other places, uh, mainly because Hong Kong was handed over to China. And because of that transfer, it uh, brought big stake in the policies and uh, new inequalities also emerged. Uh, uh, so the current campaigns are more or less surrounding on this uh, cutting point, cutting off point. Phase two is a, a, a which I term as the citizenship and equal right campaign phase, and it's a very successful phase uh, between 2004 and 9. And there have been various court cases fought in Nepal and in the UK. And phase three is the post 2009 fighting new and old inequalities. Uh, 
Uh, Sajik, may I ask you to remind me when we have got five minutes or so left? Because I've got so much stuff, so I might be not yeah, keeping. Yeah, remind you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this uh, this flowchart shows the the evolution of the British ex British Gurkha organizations. Uh, uh, beginning from 1990, uh, basically inspired by the Nepal's political change in 1990, like we have seen many other uh, organizations in Nepal that you know evolved, started to evolve in Nepal. So, Gurkha organizations also started to emerge. That's the first time they started to look at the uh, case, uh, how they were treated historically, and it started to campaign. The campaign was mostly in Nepal and Gesso. Uh, uh, Gorkha Association of uh, Yak Service Man Organization uh, uh, has been you know, one of the formidable forces and one of the biggest organizations to mobilize and led by a uh, charismatic Padam Badr Guru who led the organization until uh, 20, uh, mid uh, 2010s. Uh, there was a NESA uh, is affiliated more or less with the Nepali Congress uh, led by Deepak Guru. Uh, was kind of umbrella organization uh, of Nepali, Indian, and uh, British uh, retired soldiers. There's a NESO, uh, which I think is just a very briefly and did very small micro activities and based in Kathmandu and disappeared. And UBG GAN, which metamorphosed into Gorkha Satyagra now, was led by people like Ganraj Rai, Prem Rai. They were also initially affiliated with the Geso, but Geso uh, had several uh, splits. There were splinters. Uh, uh, in 2009, there was a big SO, big SO also had uh, three different factions uh, a bit later. Uh, by 2013, uh, one led by Santos Tholam, who joined Gorkha Satyagra, uh, 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 and one by Padam Lawati. I think it is still exists, but even I haven't seen much of the activities. Uh, and the, the, uh, <clears throat> Bhim Tumba Ampe now runs an NGO called Gorkha Peace Foundation and has been doing good work to support the elderly Gurkhas. Uh, and once the Padam Bahadur Gurung, <coughs> Gurung's guess was uh, succeeded by Krishna Rai, uh, I think Padam Bahadur uh, and uh, CB Gurung, they run the parallel guess and that also split, but I haven't heard much about that uh, in their, their activities. Uh, let me jump to the uh, campaign. The campaign moved to UK, basically. The, that's why I put the 2003 as kind of the point a 2004 as a point for the second phase. Uh, what happened is that with the transfer of the Gorkhas uh, to uh, UK, uh, you know, unlike Geso and other organizations which had uh, affiliation of the elderly uh, Gorkhas with pension or without pensions, uh, the new young uh, soldiers started to retire. Gorkhas could retire, could take pension with 15 years of services if someone joined at the age of 15, and uh, you know, people could retire at the age of 33 or 35. So that means like very young, young Gurkhas retiring in the UK by the provision of the tripartite agreement where you know, they are supposed to be recruited in Nepal and retired in Nepal. Uh, so uh, they wanted to uh, stay in the UK and where they served uh, the people and crown and have citizenship rights, uh, the settlement rights. And that campaign led the formation of the Brigade of Gurkhas Welfare Society led by Major Tikender Daldewan. Uh, is one of the good, large group of organizations. This continues to be active uh, even today. They, let, they fought a big campaign and very successful campaign. Uh, they went to home office to Liverpool uh, on 1st of September 20, 2004 and supported by Peter Carroll, uh, a man who lived in Kent and he was the spokes, spokesperson of the Leave Dem party. Uh, Dhan Gurung uh, was the first councillor from Nepal to be elected, uh, first councillor in the UK. Uh, with the through Dhan Grung, Peter Carroll came to the campaign uh, Daily Express, which is normally seen as a kind of a right wing uh, paper, uh, gave a big support. So many other other papers to the support of the Gorkhas, and there was a kind of the big debate about the you know anti immigrant uh, debate going on. But Gorkhas were seen as a heroes, as a military soldier, uh, soldier citizens and who deserved to be in the UK. So a, a front page uh, uh, coverage uh, was published on 27th, uh, 27th August 2004, written by uh, James Slack. 
Uh, the, their campaign was uh, in a way successful. Uh, the British government changed the immigration policy, allowing Gurkhas who retired uh, in the, in the, after 1997 with four years of services could apply for uh, permanent residence. But that decision in a way uh, invited a kind of a disc discrimination. So does that mean that the Gurkhas who served outside UK for British Queen and the British people stationed some in the forest? So does that mean that their services doesn't count? Does that mean that their services is no value uh, to be counted as a kind of a link to the Britain? To the, Britain? the campaign continued and uh, uh, Peter Carroll uh, managed to bring Joanna Lumley. Joanna Lumley with a you know, high profile celebrity, uh, 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 in sitcoms, uh, sitcoms whose father had uh, served in the Gurkhas uh, in Burma and through the Indian Indian uh, British Indian Army, uh, and he was basically saved by Tul Bahadur Pun, who is, is seen on the picture here with the medals in the left. He's also Victoria Cross holder. And uh, they met uh, in London. Tulbadur Grung explained the story to Jonah Lumley, uh, which was very emotional. And uh, Tulbadur said, "You are like, uh, you know, a daughter to me." And so she became the daughter of Nepal. And they argued for the debt of honor, the Gorkha service, and it was a high-profile campaign, so high-profile that it shook the political seats of the Westminster. The court may leave them. Uh, the leader, there's a quite uh, young, energetic leader, Nick Clegg, uh, was there, and they managed to garner the support of the Conservative Party, even Labour Party's members supported, including Martin Salter, uh, supported, and there was a the opposition uh, 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 proposed uh, uh, motion in the House uh, on 29th of April 2009, uh, in which this, uh, Gordon Brown's uh, you know, sitting prime minister lost, uh, lost in that uh, voting. That was a very unprecedented for any sitting prime minister, even though it was a non-binding for previous several decades, at least three decades, I think. Uh, so the campaign means like what happened is that the, in uh, uh, 2008, uh, the Geso supported a, a, a case of five uh, ex gurkhas who were being deported uh, and they went to high court and the high court uh, decided that gurkhas service outside UK is also counted, is valuable. So they should be allowed to apply for their residence. Uh, so British government tried to create uh, various uh, stringent criteria, which means like mean, meant that it excluded many of them. So this campaign had to be fought, and the success in Parliament meant that the Gordon Brown's government uh, brought the policy changes, allowing all Gurkhas, irrespective of when and where they served, with four years of services and their uh, widows and uh, the mm, children under 18 uh, to come to the UK. There was a huge success in terms of citizenship uh, at the time when the you know the you know high at the height of the migration and anti-migration rhetoric in the UK and the Europe. Uh, Gurkha, Gurkhas were seen as a heroes and the date of uh, honor was paid off. Uh, so th there's, there have been these kind of uh, uh, achievements, including one uh, success in the court that the prisoner of, prison of, of war who fought in Japanese uh, with uh, in Japan, uh, against Japan in Burma, uh, you know, the compensation was received for the Indian army by the British government, which was not distributed. So Gorkha, uh, basically through Geso, they went to court and they won it. And the uh, relative people had been distributed that uh, money. Uh, in 2007, the British government brought this uh, Gorkha offer to transfer from one pension scheme to another pension scheme. Uh, only to the people who retired after the 1997. So 1997 became kind of the uh, point, cutting off point, also a, a major point, uh, you know, that created discrimination among uh, Gurkhas themselves. Uh, uh, and the, they were allowed to transfer to the Armed Forces Pension Scheme, uh, the scheme uh, uh, for the native British uh, soldiers, uh, which is much better, but their service outside UK was not counted year for year, uh, you know, before, uh, before 1997. So that's the one end of the debate is still going on, uh, a point of discrimination, Gorkha's highlighting. 
Uh, and in 2007, the uh, British government brought uh, new trumps for the serving Gurkhas. So the GPS was disbanded at that point uh, for the new, 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 new Gurkhas. Serving Gurkhas are more or less treated in the equal terms. That means like they won't be able to get pension uh, when they finish their service in 15 years, they will need to now wait for 22 years, but they get the equal pay. So uh, there's a different categories of Gurkhas that were uh, created. Uh, and uh, uh, so the court cases, I think I highlighted before. Uh, then uh, there was a huge public support basically uh, in that high profile campaign in 2009. Uh, that means uh, there, there was a kind of the impression, wide impression that the Gurkha's problems were solved uh, once and for all. Uh, so there were no problems, uh, outstanding problems remaining. Uh, it was kind of the cooling period uh, of few years. Gurkha took stock of what they achieved and what not. Geso decided to take a little bit of the backseat and they wanted to a focus in creating uh, in the uh, 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 memorial uh, for, for the fallen Gurkhas in Satyagra in Nepal. Uh, at the same time, a group of other Gurkhas realized that, okay, the citizenship uh, or the residence rights have been achieved to, to the large extent, but what about the discrimination or the differences in the pay and pensions and many other injustices that they faced in the past? And they did uh, campaigning, uh, uh, 100,000 of the signatures were, uh, sorry, uh, uh, petition uh, signatures were submitted to the prime minister asking for, for the parliamentary debate. That was an ATIP. So uh, the, the Satyagra, which was a kind of the con conglomeration of the, uh, conglomeration of the uh, various Gurkha organizations, some just giving support, others merging into a, as a kind of the organization. Uh, they, so they stage this hunger strike uh, in the Downing Street in front of the prime minister's office in 2013. Uh, and it was Gyanraj Rai who staged hunger strike for, for 14 days. And uh, finally, the government uh, said, okay, we'll form the parliamentary inquiry, uh, which uh, the Gurkhas agreed on. I was also the a, one of the negotiations in the parliament uh, led by, there was a committee formed led by Jackie Duell Price, who was the chair of the all party parliamentary groups uh, in the parliament. And, uh, uh, and there was a hearing. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, describe a little bit more about this uh, further. Uh, and, uh, the, and there came the this uh, celebration of Britain Nepal relations of the you know 200 years relations kept, uh, keeping Gorkha as the center point and is a, is a kind of the fatigue for four years every ambassador from Nepal that came to UK wanted to do something uh, and they went on you know the, it went on for four years uh, and Gorkhas were, were hoping that something would be announced in the favor but just to their disappointment nothing happened uh, the case at the, mm, the European Court for Human Rights, uh, uh, the discrimination um, case uh, based on the you know, race, age, and other things was also lost. Uh, and uh, the, the court said that uh, you are allowed to discriminate people as long as you justify it. So this kind of the negative uh, discrimination also is possible. Uh, and uh, then Gorkha, uh, uh, on the on the on the Satyagra, uh, there's a 24 YMPs participated in the all party groups and the committee chairperson uh, Jackie Doyle Price, which can be seen in this picture in the center, uh, and they agreed that uh, it's completely unfair. Uh, you know, Gorkha, Gorkha's terms and conditions. Uh, you know, once the Gorkha's terms and conditions were equalized for the serving Gorkhas, that means like they were. Uh, you know, uh, injustice in the past. And they also concluded that, to be honest, they have been treated quite unfairly. That's, that's the statement from them. And the 1997 uh, arbitrary debt is not also justified. Why some people before serving before that debt are treated differently than others. Uh, they agreed on many of the demands put forth by Gurkhas, except the pension, pension case citing that there was still pending court cases in the European court. 
uh, and uh, but British government rejected all of them, uh, except increasing some fund for the Gorkha Welfare Trust, providing health services in Nepal. They added, given some more money uh, from the liver uh, fund that they, they had penalized uh, a company and the, the penalty collected was, uh, some of them was allocated to Gorkha Welfare Trust, uh, the charity that works for Gorkha in Nepal, uh, also now in, in UK. And also one demand, one recommendation was to increase money to GFID. Uh, appreciating the close, close relation to them. And they said, okay, we'll do that. Uh, I think the um, DFID is more or less as a kind of the major donor in Nepal. Uh, frustrated with the lack of any, uh, any achievement from that hunger strike, Gorkha again threatened to go to another hunger strike in 2016. And we had uh, Durga Subedi as an ambassador. Kamal Thapa came to participate in Britain Nepal uh, bicentenary celebration uh, in the UK. And he also instructed a Nepali ambassador. Uh, so uh, they asked Gorkha not to go for hunger strike. And instead, they decided to form a, a technical committee. Uh, is also known as the Taipei Technical Committee, participated by the British government, uh, Nepali government officials, and the Gorkhas themselves. And the committee uh, uh, in which uh, our colleague Chandra Lagzamba also participated, uh, submitted a report in 2018. And unlike uh, what Gorkha, uh, how this was popularized as a kind of big achievement, how it was very, very frustrating to re read the reports. Basically in that report, Gorkha's demand, uh, demands were synthesized uh, into 13 concise points. Uh, but in the, the, in the, at the same time, uh, the British government uh, the representatives have also put the observations and the response in each demand, you know, in, in a way capping or sabotaging uh, everything put forth by the Gurkhas. And uh, they, they didn't make any recommendations, but they hoped that the respective governments would study this, this report and would take necessary actions if there, were, there was any ground for that. So British government's uh, the, the argument is that there's no thing, you know, no, no thing has, you know, necessary to be, no, no action is necessary to be taken. So only uh, medical treatment uh, demand, uh, Gorkha asks that they, okay, the treatment should be, you know, equal to what Indian uh, army get in Nepal. So they said they will do it. And pension send, send uh, pension in pound directly to Nepal. And on that, the, the British uh, representative said, okay, who told you that we are not sending pound to Nepal? So it is just kind of confusion. Uh, we have been doing that, we'll do it. So that's all. So no, no other things you know, were agreed uh, so in terms of equality. So the Gorkha hope that both government will uh, do something uh, uh, based on that report, uh, especially uh, in the face that the, in the 2019, Nepal's prime minister KP Wally came to UK and uh, he raised the points of Gorkhas and uh, it came in, in that joint communication issued after the, the uh, meeting of uh, Theresa May and KP Woli that uh, they will continue dialogue on Gorkhas. Nothing has happened. Uh, and the British government now is saying that, okay, we have been raising pension, uh, basically not on the basis of this report is, is because Indian uh, government revised its uh, pay, pay, pay in 2016, the seventh pay commission. So British, British government, which says that it follows the tripartite agreement and in which pegs Gorkha's benefits to Indian army pay. Uh, so is obliged to do it. So I think they're going away from the commitment of making it 100% higher. And now this time they're going to make it just 40% uh, higher, it looks like. Uh, so the new, new pay, pension rise is coming. But uh, the, the demands put forth by Gorkhas are not addressed. Uh, and so Gorkha now think that there's a time that they must do something. So why discriminate, why hesitation? What are the differences? I, let me just give you uh, a couple of uh, illustration examples. Uh, for example, uh, you know, we computed uh, the pension differences between the uh, Gorkhas and the native British uh, who served in the British army. Uh, in 1989, uh, warrant officer first uh, in British Army would get to 5,269 as a pension per year. Whereas Gorkha, 
would get uh, Nepali Gurkha would get 498. There's a 900, almost 100,000 percent difference. Captain, in the same way, there's a big difference. And with the uh, improvement in the pension, British government has been improving the pension of Gurkhas. Uh, this is a scenario is still is very different. If we compare uh, British and Commonwealth veterans uh, of the uh, warrant officer two. Uh, uh, who are in the armed forces pension scheme uh, with 22 years service, so like like for like comparison, they would get more than a 12,000 pension. Uh, they, they got more than 12,000 pound pension a year compared to uh, Gurkha, uh, uh, who retired before 1997, getting just 4,043. It's still the di differences is you know three uh, three times. Uh, and the people who were allowed to transfer their pension from the Gurkha pension scheme to armed forces pension scheme, uh, uh, you know, for the services, they, uh, uh, prior to 1997, uh, uh, 1990, uh, actually their service was not counted year for year. Only, only, only the period of service, you know, uh, service they had in UK was counted year for year. But prior to that, they said you were not in the UK, so your service would be uh, counted in an actuarial basis, which means that you know the, the one-year service, only 36% to 23% fraction of the service would be counted for that purpose. So this is another uh, point of uh, uh, dispute, and a group of Gurkhas, I think led by Major Uday Groom, are thinking about doing and taking some legal action. Uh, there have already been some legal cases on that and lost, and and there are many other uh, benefits, uh, you know, dis dis discrepancies. For example, the British uh, soldiers with 22 years services, uh, the uh, warrant officer first uh, would get terminal grant uh, in 1989, 15,800. Whereas Gorkha wouldn't get that one, but they would get uh, death come retirement uh, grant, which is 4,092. So this is it's a big difference here. So large group of Gurkhas that I explained before who retired basically between, who served between 1948 and 1975 uh, with service between four to nine years. If they had served 10 years, they would have got some pension. Uh, and, uh, they were sent home only with 300 to 360 pension. Basically they had nothing uh, and no longer any benefits. So that's why, uh, you know, the Gurkha Welfare Trust, uh, which uh, generate charity money uh, he started to serve very poor uh, Gurkhas, just giving 40 pounds as a charity benefit, welfare benefit, or the pension, what they call charity uh, welfare pension, is not pension at all. Uh, I don't know how I'm doing in terms of time. Uh, uh, you still have, yeah, you still have uh, five more minutes. Okay, I might stress a bit more. Uh, I'm sorry for that, but I'll try to jump now. So the British government position is that they, okay, we have been serving Gurkhas very fairly. And they sometimes they use kind of the examples that they haven't even receiving more than Nepal army captain or equal to prime minister. And those kind of uh, arguments are there for the justify the fair treatment. And they say, mm, Gurkha are even in advantage position because they got get immediate pension with a service of 15 years. Whereas they, for the British soldiers, they have to serve for 22 years if this, leave army serving 15 years, they will get, they will not get immediate pension. Of course, they will get some uh, freezer pensions which they get in at the time of their retirement age, uh, ranging from 60 to 65. Uh, they say we cannot uh, give any pension retrospectively. Uh, you agreed on the terms, so you need to stay on that one. Uh, so implication of doing anything retrospective is very, very huge. Uh, and cost of, and they also say the cost of increasing pension is so high. They, they at one point, they, you know, uh, the uh, Ministry of Defense uh, submitted to court that the, you know, it is going to cost 1.3 billion pound. So we can't do it. So that means like uh, Gurkhas who have come to the UK without a pension, they get the benefit whole pension credit. Uh, so they do not have entitlement. Uh, you know, that's the, that's one of the crux of the whole problems and, uh, you know, a, 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 a connected to their dignity. Uh, okay, so the uh, major points uh, from the Gurkha side is that the, okay, uh, what is the, the, the UK's obligation of the, you know, the, uh, human rights of the Gurkhas? Uh, okay, 
equal uh, remuneration convention of ILO, European uh, uh, Convention on Human Rights that uh, also talks about the eco equality, United Nations declarations of the uh, human rights. Uh, how does that apply to us? You know, that's the one of the points that he looks at. Uh, and then the, the other point about the change context, the Britain's, uh, you, know, more, you know, so many justifications and the, the, that comes from the British side said, Gurkhas were paid fairly considering the quality of life in Nepal. But now we know that the, uh, more than half of the Gurkhas have come to UK. So what happens to them? So that argument no, holder, no longer holds the ground. Uh, the cost of living, again, the Gurkhas are saying that they, because you have to pay us the, this benefit, pension credit, which is costing you more. Why don't you give us the, you know, it, our entitlement, the rightful money, uh, so that we can live with dignity, not the benefit, mean tested benefit. And uh, there's a, especially there's a large number of Gurkhas, elderly Gurkhas, with, uh, you know, who, uh, very little pension or without pension, they are dying very, very fast. Uh, so their number is dwindling. Uh, so with that, that means like the cost, cost you know, that uh, British government if equalizes the pension has to pay will decrease every year. But if it doesn't give justice, I think there's so many people will be dying uh, with the false hope of being treated equally. Uh, is a, uh, uh, so there are all the international cases, for example, India treats Gorkhas on equal terms, has always been treating equal terms in terms of benefits, at least. If, the, if not in the uh, matter of promotions too. Uh, France used to have the foreign veterans who serve it in its army uh, uh, rectify these errors and it gave uh, equal pension to the old veterans. USA also started treating, uh, treating Filipino veterans uh, more or less in equal terms. Why UK is lagging behind is a question. So the tripartite agreement uh, is uh, one of the uh, most fraught uh, tool, I think, is a colonial era instrument used and misused uh, a, a, to serve the interest and the convenience of the you know party that is powerful. Uh, and we even do not sure what 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 uh, comprises of this this tripartite agreement. Uh, but uh, the British government's justification is that the you know the is the tripartite agreement. It says the Gurkhas pay is admissible on the basis of Indian pay code. Uh, on 7 uh, November uh, 1947, uh, they signed a, a, a bipartite agreement, India and Britain, uh, which Nepal basically objected and sent it observation. It says Gurkha must be treated on equal footing in order to uh, wipe out this stigma of mercenary troops. So that's the whole ethos of Nepal, uh, the, which becomes also part of the tripartite agreement is that Gurkha Nepali should be treated on equal footing. So that's the argument all in you know, Gorkha have been always making. And there was a counter uh, response. They say subject to limitations of finance and supply. So these are the points I think of the arguments that uh, Gorkha and Britain government taking different stands. Uh, let me, I think in the interest of time, let me not go much into uh, 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 other things that. So the, at the heart of this uh, the Gorkha agitation, is basically not the money financial. Is a part, you know, the dignity, sense of dignity. They want to feel that uh, may, may, kind of dignity. Uh, so, uh, 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 sociologist Bon where uh, wrote, wrote a paper on a, uh, military citizenship with the case of Gorkhas, and she highlighted that in uh, citizen soldiers are in advantage position. That's why Gorkha were successful in getting that uh, residence rights. But that is only half truth because they gain this uh, residence right, uh, some of them. Uh, but all the demands of the equality, you know, they haven't uh, seen in, 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 in equally uh, equal terms. Uh, also, Britain's Britain's attempts to justify a difference payments, I think, is very much influenced by the colonial legacy. Gorkha remained to be, of, you know, institutions instituted during the colonial times, and uh, and this is very much in in, in presence. And there, I mean, sometimes to me it feels like like you know, with the analogy that, uh, okay, now this time you arguing with the you know somebody who was treated as a, a slave in the past to say that okay, it's not our fault because it's you who agreed to be slave. You know, it's, I think these kind of ju the justifications are. 
uh, difficult to understand and to agree with. Uh, uh, so, uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, reflecting a little bit on the Gorkha campaigns, uh, Charles Taylor, uh, uh, who has written on social movements, uh, uh, movements uh, and his book in 2000, Post Social, uh, social Movements, he points out the four points uh, uh, which are necessary for the successful uh, you know, movements. So uh, Gorkha's uh, campaign between 2004 and nine, more or less, I think, met these four points, the worthiness, unity, numbers, and commitments. Their commitment even today uh, to go uh, fast unto death, never give up. Numbers, uh, they had a huge support from the public. In, in 2004, 99% of the public uh, who participated in the uh, uh, Delhi Express poll supported the cause. Uh, unity is something questionable because Gurkhas are bitterly divided as this uh, uh, flowchart I say, showed before. But when it comes to the point of the uh, successful movements, they are always giving support to, lending support to each other. Uh, 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 they are tr trying to justify the worthiness. They are trying to show that they are very loyal to, the, to Britain. They are seen wearing uniforms, medals, marching in the streets, uh, celebrating Victoria Day. You know, all those kind of that they have been doing, but is the same tempo uh, is still there is a question. I think uh, just to summarize, uh, Nepal's post-1990 uh, political change has a huge, huge impact uh, everywhere in Nepal and here in terms of uh, organizing and uh, fighting for uh, their rights by the subaltern and the you know, deprived groups. So, so did the Gorkhas. Uh, Gorkhas uh, shift to UK and basically enable them to become a citizen actors who set agendas, even influence the governments. So they influence the diplomatic relations too. Uh, take the example of the, the, the Gorkhas forcing both governments, Nepal government, I don't think they, it had so much interest in the past, to do something to raise this issue. Uh, including their participation, unsuccessful participation for the vac you know, vaccine support to Nepal, uh, the protest against Modi's uh, blockade to Nepal when it came to UK, there was a large protest and the, it was shocking uh, in from Modi. I think it, I know we read in the newspapers that he even ordered, uh, who even ordered the uh, investigation of the influence the Nepalese were having in the UK. In all those kind of, you know, as, as a citizen actor, and it's been possible basically since they have received to the UK, to mobilize and educate British people that they've been unfairly treated. And the campaigners were so successful to highlight the contribution they made, which was not noticed before. Now, Sikh communities, which came to, you know, we had did some discussions are uh, saying that the, you know, the British history books and the curriculum must write about the contribution made by uh, these uh, soldiers, Gurkhas and other foreign soldiers, uh, so which is lacking. Uh, so the progress are, there have been progresses. The British government uh, have been improving its policies and is equalized the terms of the serving Gurkhas. Uh, and this kind of the cycle, and some Gurkha groups seems to be uh, feel tired, others energize. Uh, this is my last slide, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll complete. Uh, 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 of course, there is a kind of the competition. Uh, uh, many Gurkha groups were formed just to, you know, stay in the limelight, to become leader and to generate uh, donations, and there's a question of transparency. There's a question of accountability uh, as well. And the, in, in the very recent survey uh, in 2019, we conducted for the British uh, Forces charity called SAFA. Uh, you know, in our survey, Gorkha said that the, we have been donating British, you know, ex Gorkha organizations, but we basically haven't received any support from them in our um, integration in our um, settlement in the UK. Uh, in order to succeed. It is clear that we need a native campaign, basically led, led by powerful people. Reinventing that kind of campaign is very, very hard. Uh, as, as I said before, that many people tend to think that, okay, Gurkhas, uh, you know, grievances have been met largely. Uh, and Gurkhas uh, campaigns often are emotionally charged and the MOT is, is capable of sabotaging both in, uh, in, the, uh, in the court and outside. So Gorkha lack a serious research, basically. They have got a, definitely a special case, uh, but they are repeating same things. So I think that they need to do serious research 
to counter the uh, arguments by Modi. Uh, and uh, also the idea that Gorkha as a corner stone between the you know, friendly nations, two, two nations. Uh, and we have recently had a test case uh, where the Gorkhas and non-Gorkhas Nepali campaigners and the Nepali campaigners came to the state of London is basically failed. We thought we have been asking, please give us 1.3 million doses of vaccine so that Nepal's uh, elderly people who got first, first dose can get the second one. There's been no response. And they have been repeating the same report. We have given so much money, this much money, one police, you know, ventilator and police, uh, uh, police headquarters and this and that. They have been supporting, but the special friendship that we have been talking about. And recently Denmark sent some vaccines to Bhutan, but Denmark didn't do that to Nepal. They could, if they wanted, give those vaccines and they haven't. And they said through the, you know, COVAX schemes. Uh, so the test of special friendship, I think is a bitterly failed. Maybe the campaign also, you know, didn't meet uh, the, some of the points that's highlighted before. So are Gorkha in the, to, in, at the dead end? Where are, what is the way out from here? Uh, um, Gorkha have been arguing that the both governments should, should sit together. Uh, seriously, and diplomatic, uh, uh, diplomatic uh, channel is the way out now because they saturated more or less in the court. They have been doing what they could do. And the next thing they can, can do is to, you know, threat to take their own lives through the Satyagraha. Uh, that's what they, they have been proposing from the 21 uh, July. Uh, nobody wants to stop the uh, Gorkha recruitment, no matter this is the continuation of the colonial era. Is Gorkha cannot do it, even though they say sometimes, you know, some of them talk and give the big political talks, because if they try to do it, uh, you know, they will be chased by the, you know, those people who want to be Gurkhas. You have seen people carrying Doko, you know, Doko race in Pokhara, um, 25, 30,000 people, you know, aspiring to be Gurkhas. Uh, political parties, uh, Baburam, Batra, and others talk about it, but they will never, never, never will do it. And Nepal government wants to use Gurkha connections uh, for its diplomatic benefits. So this is a very kind of the you know state a uh, as I look, like to call dead and I think with this I would like to uh, stop here. Thank you uh, for listening and let's discuss. Uh... Thank you, Krishna Adhikari, uh, for your wonderful presentation. Now I want to open floor. Please let me know if you have questions, comments. You can raise your hand. Yeah, you can you can basically even contribute. I we have got Dr. Mulbi Rai here, who is a retired guy himself. Okay, uh, Pratish Wanta has a question. Pratish, I see. Uh, Krishna ji, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I have, um, I, I guess, I didn't quite understand uh, what you said uh, because you said you made a very quick uh, passing reference to DFID. I mean, I I in the negotiation. Uh, sending more money to Nepal by DFID uh, entered uh, some kind of a negotiation. I, I think you said it so quickly that I couldn't really catch it. What, what was that? Um, especially in light of the fact that even though DFID has been one of the largest uh, donors uh, for many years, the largest donor in Nepal, it's also well known that uh, uh, over many years, it was not able to spend the money that was allocated uh, to its Nepal office and the money actually went back. And uh, I don't know the situation in the last two or three years, but prior to that, it was the case for quite a few years. So that's point one. And point two, I think uh, near the end of your presentation, you made uh, some references to the fact that many of the uh, uh, pro Gorkha groups that have, you know, come that have splintered uh, there was a there was a question about uh, lack of transparency. Uh, I remember uh, reading and actually I, I interviewed Padam Badu Gurungji about the movement in its very early days, back in 1992 in Pokhara, and uh, the the movement that he led was always marred by accusations about lack of transparency. So so could you kind of elaborate on on the, on the last uh, point as well? Uh, shall I answer? Yes, please. Okay, thank you, Pratishji. Uh, 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 very good questions. Uh, I think on the point uh, DFID, 
the uh, parliamentary inquiry group uh, recommended British government that uh, Nepal is a special friend through this Gorkha connections and is a poor country. So GFI needs to invest more with priority. That's what they recommended. And the British government uh, responded that we have been doing this uh, with uh, this mean these many millions. Uh, I've, I am um, I don't have the figures in my head at the moment, uh, and we have been increasing over the years, making more or less 90 million plus uh, mm, 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 allocated to Nepal every year. That's what they responded. I think that's the only one point they they said they will do. Well, I haven't followed if they, they actually have done it. Uh, and thank you also for the information that the money actually comes back, which uh, I didn't know much uh, before. Uh, so uh, that's great. And the lack of transparency is, you are right that uh, it's always a question, a blaming and counter blaming. Uh, and Gurkha uh, organization, especially Geso, and even the, in, uh, in the campaigns, they need money. Uh, they con they raise money, donations, monies from the uh, elderly Gurkhas, uh, especially those, I think, uh, uh, who, who, who are on the uh, uh, GPS pensions. Uh, so, Padambadur uh, Gurung's Geso, I think they uh, blame each other, even for this, uh, uh, I think there is something going on in the Salmedana case too. They receive government money and the, they are blaming each other of the, the embezzlement of the money there. Uh, and in the UK, uh, there is huge amount of money. I don't know how much. And there was uh, Gopal Sivakoti also employed. Uh, who also people said that he was hugely paid, but he also uh, alleged that you know he didn't get uh, enough uh, of what he was supposed to do. He also uh, blame others. So these kind of uh, uh, blames and counter blames are there, and the Gorkha organizations haven't published anything uh, properly. Uh, you know, so there's a complete lack of transparency. I think this is uh, this blame stands. Uh, so and they also the accountability. Uh, uh, I think that's all I have to, to say in this one. Right. Uh, um, since there's one question uh, we receive uh, on Facebook. Shall I read? Um, could yeah, you I can tell read us that. about Yeah, please. Yes. Right. Okay. So, Bina Ji, uh, sorry, Sangeeta Ji. Yes. Uh, thank you for the question. Could you tell us about the role that Nepali state has played in Gurkha's campaigns for rights and dignity? How reluctant and supportive has it been? Mm -hmm. I think the Nepal's government, uh, to the large part, uh, I mean, we're talking about uh, after the Second World War and before, uh, I think the runners had their own interest. Uh, uh, and uh, to, the, to the large part after the Second World War, Nepali state has been very, very reluctant, a passive player uh, and, and to the, the old Gurkha saga. Uh, they, as I said before, they, they have started acting a little bit only after the Gurkhas, you know, themselves uh, uh, started to poke them and prompt them. Uh, like the Gyanraj Rai they went to Supreme Court uh, in 2000, uh, and Nepal Supreme Court said, it is out of our remit, we cannot do anything. It was that time the Parliamentary Committee on Foreign Affairs, uh, led by J.B. Gupta, I think, uh, you know, that time they took little action. Uh, and following this, uh, uh, Nepal government, I, I don't know if they have done anything substantial, even though, you know, the political parties are quick whenever they come to UK. Uh, it was said about it was Mother Nepal or somebody who you know raised this point to go, but I don't think they have you know seriously raised it. There's two reasons there. I think one, Nepal's uh, political clout and you know to, uh, ability to make diplomatic influence is very different from the 1850s. In 1850, uh, when the Jangabadus uh, team came to UK, uh, there was a captain, Nepali army captain, uh, who could influence the change of the map drawn by Britain. I mean, that was published in uh, Illustrated News London. And within a week, he was asked in a conference and there was a change. It's unlike that time, 
uh, Nepal government, I think it looks like in, even in the vaccine, you know, this time the vaccine case, Nepal prime minister made personal appeal, wrote, uh, the, it, I mean, I, I read in the newspaper that the Nepal uh, president wrote to the queen, you know, they are you know, just ignored. Uh, so it's a very passive, uh, Nepal government role is very passive. They didn't care much, it looks like, but only past few years, I think they are paying attention. I mean, even the new ambassador Nepal, of Nepal to UK, uh, he must be worried. Uh, so he wants to do something if he, if he could. I'm not sure maybe if he will be able to do anything. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Mulvi Rai, do you want to add something? Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, you're okay. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Krishna, Krishna, sir, uh, we're both in the UK and I, this is a very good reminiscent of uh, uh, two decades ago where I've been to Martin Chaudhary. Uh, it's very nice to see uh, Pratishji and yourself, Harshamanji, and Rook, I can see Rook. Um, and I briefly noticed David Gallagher as well. Uh, if, uh, but I, I can't see, uh, I've got a big namaste to him. Um, Right, one, one a very tiny thing I would like to add on Dr. Krishna's presentation is that one thing, it is not very important though, one thing the uh, participants had to uh, know, uh, be in the know is uh, one, I would say it's missing, but it looks like uh, your presentation didn't cover one thing that is Zimas, Gurkha Married Accompanied Service. Uh, in the past, what happened to me was uh, uh, once a, a Nepali young joined the British Army, uh, every three years he would get five to six months, sometimes three months, which we called Nepal leave, a long leave as well. Uh, and during that period, he wouldn't get any money. You, you just get the um, a benefit, which uh, four rupees, five rupees a day. That, that's all. And in terms of married accompanied service, one uh, soldier who served 15 years, basically from rifleman to corporal uh, or rank, they would serve only 15 years. During that 15 years period, they would get only three years married accompanied service, only three years maximum. And that ended in 2004. In 2004, what happened, uh, the review of GMAS, Gurkha Merit Accompanied Service, um, introduced and that abolished the previous system. And the new system came where the a Gurkha who served four years in the UK or wherever it is, after four years, if he married, if he's married, he can bring his family over. So that's, that's the changes. Uh, one thing happened in 2004. The other thing I, uh, I noticed uh, was, uh, right, probably this time, time is, uh, we haven't got plenty of time. One thing, I'm, I, I am a little bit in doubt whether you understood uh, service relaxed. Only, you know, certain percentage of service will be counted if a Gurkha has served, uh, Southeast. Southeast means Hong Kong, Brunei, Malaysia, not Malaysia, but some, some uh, few Gurkhas has served in the embassy. But those, uh, you know, part of the world, they have served, the whole service will not be counted. For example, my service, I served in Hong Kong for four years, from 1993 to 1997, my service uh, will be counted as one year and three months. That means 29%. So that's only one thing I, I, I wanted to elaborate or uh, you know, make it clear to the participants. And thank you very much indeed to uh, uh, Krishna sir and uh, Martin Chautari. My name is Mulibir Rai, by the way, and uh, I served in, 20, uh, in the British Army 25 years. Only last year I retired. Um, and uh, sorry, it's, my, it's not my you know, a big head and, you know, white chest. What I'm saying is I was the first person to get, uh, to attend doctorate while in the service. 
while in the service. When I was in the service, I attend my doctorate. So yeah, that, that's all. Sorry, sorry. That is my uh, you know uh, with big uh, your namaskar. Yeah, that's all. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you, uh, Naresh Rai. Naresh Naresh Kapangi. Ah uh, yes, Kapangi. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Okay. Naresh. Uh, Do you want to ask yourself? Or you can just read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Narasimh Mulbirji as well. Um, of course, uh, there are many points raised by Gorkha which I didn't go through, uh, basically, uh, including you know when they were say, sent to went home on leave, only five percent of all their salary was paid, and the rest wasn't paid. There are several other points anyway, I, the, which was in the list there. But thank you for adding uh, more points. Uh, to clarify, Narasji is a quick question uh, on the okay. What could be the solution here? That should, be, if the UK government apologizes Gorkhas for the injustice, could that uh, close that chapter? I don't think uh, that is a big, uh, big uh, uh, response. I think that would make a big difference. Uh, uh, and that would uh, allow Gorkha to think about the consistency. I think that they are always talking about consistency. They want something, a kind of the, uh, the substance to achieve, also for the something for uh, you know safe landing too. Uh, so British government definitely need to think a, a something symbolic in terms of uh, satisfying Gorkhas. Uh, also, they need to, they cannot ignore, I think. There's a serious cases, these are accepted by the court, court accepted historical injustices, accepted by parliamentary committees. Even the MOD thinks that, you know, if equalizing, you know, money is equalized, I need to be, the cost will be too high to bear. So that means there's some kind of acceptance. So you cannot always use uh, to argue, uh, you know, using this the colonial era, era tools that okay, you were happy to solve that, so you cannot now ask for uh, equal treatment. I think that uh, will not satisfy Gorkhas. So the uh, uh, combination of uh, something, some gesture to respect the dignity of the the frail and dying soldiers, and some sort of redress, a, 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 a you know, in sim in material terms. Of the injustices meted out to them, uh, they have been saying that the, we are we are ready to compromise with the you know in terms of the cutting point uh, cut off points in terms of the, you know how to trim this if if compensation or you know pension changes it, you know affects uh, affects then the, the, it could be kind of the goodwill gesture or something. If something has to be done, you know the France has done it, uh, even USA has done it. Uh, so the British government, uh, I don't think, can ignore this. If they ignore this, I think the history will be written in a very black way. You know, it, it will be very treated as a very black period. Thank you. Um, right. Thank you. Uh, I think Sanjay Sharma raised his hand. Uh, Sanjay Zee? Yeah, okay. Sanjay is doing races and group. Is okay. Thank you. Um, uh, also, uh, hello, this is, uh, good to see you after so long. Uh, I had a very quick question. Uh, uh, I, I just want to piggyback on what Dr. Munguli earlier said. Um, he talked about the, um, the Gurkha married a component service, but I, I wanted to extend it towards um, uh, the, the larger uh, diversity of Gurkha women who are present in the UK uh, for many years now and have been uh, a substantial part of the Gurkha uh, justice campaign as well. Right. Um, as we saw in your photos, uh, uh, the women have contributed uh, um, substantially uh, in many regards, but they are not uh, as much uh, given credit for what they have done. Uh, mostly, when when uh, when we talk about Rukhya Sahu's campaign and the um, and the benefits that came out of it, it's mostly uh, given to um, the veterans or the campaigners themselves. Uh, so if we have to locate uh, women, except uh, Zuana Lumley, uh, who could be the, um, uh, the few women who have done um, uh, some litigation or advocacy, or even more than that, just, just participating in all these uh, campaign activities alongside all these veterans, uh, 
um, and um, and advocating for the rights of the Gurkhas um, and their children. Thank you. Right. Uh, I think uh, this is not a question, but just observation. Yeah, you're right that uh, since the family of Gurkhas uh, are allowed to come here, even the widows, I think there are some some widows also uh, playing major parts. And then, uh, you know, in the next uh, uh, Satyagraha, uh, so far as I, I understand, of three people, uh, one of the person uh, you know who is going to stay uh, pass on to death, the hunger strike is a woman. Uh, so their role is uh, huge. Uh, it's because the British uh, the army, uh, until recently, uh, only recruited uh, Nepali men. Uh, so the whole Gorkha has become kind of the domain for them, and the, you know, for only only they are big, you know, on the limelight, and they are the ones forming organizations. They are the ones uh, leading them. But I think they they, they started to have uh, committee members uh, representing women, uh, the participants too. But I think uh, the, uh, their, their, their contribution uh, needs to be recognized more in, in our works and uh, wishes. Thank you. And uh, Rukhji has asked something. Uh, is there any question? Yeah. There? Yes, we have a few questions from uh, Facebook. Oh, I see. So you can you read it? Right. Oh, is this from Facebook? Yes, uh, from Mahindra Bantama, I believe. Oh, I see Bantama Mahindra. It's a great presentation. Thank you very much, Kishan. Sorry, I wanted to small query that what might be the best fit strategy for contributing from both government and ex Gurkhas to the original place of ex Gurkhas who are now staying in the UK, enjoying frustrating with the small village allowances. What could be the future of the dependents of the ex who are in Nepal with the fully dependent implants? I know these are the you know, difficult questions. I mean, the, the Gorkha campaigners are arguing that if, if, if you equalize the benefits to the Gorkhas, uh, if you give them their rightful entitlements, many of them uh, will be going back to Nepal. So that means like the money would be paid in Nepal at the moment, what is happening is that the those who do not have pension or who didn't have enough pension and living on uh, pension credit, they receive mean tested benefit, which means like you know it is only measure to fulfill their needs, daily needs, livelihood needs, uh, you know living cost. Uh, so many Gorkhas, uh, you know, despite this, elder Gorkhas who who have got dependents in Nepal, they basically cutting what they call ghati uh, gas cutting. A, and trying to save a little bit to pay off the debts, you know, which they took while coming to UK, they are hugely indebted. Many of them sold, uh, you know, pricely lands while coming, also supporting, you know, uh, people in Nepal. On the other hand, I think um, as the more and more new Gurkhas settle in the UK, I think there has been there had been some kind of the reverse remittance as well. I think people started to sell their houses in Dharan and Pokhara. And uh, you know they might have brought money to buy her, you know, new new house in, in the UK. Uh, so this is difficult questions. Uh, I mean, Gurkha organizations uh, they have been asking that you know please do more to support uh, Gurkhas Nepal. Uh, uh, in the case of adult dependents who are living in Nepal, the Gurkha campaigners have been asking. I think that's one of the major points. There have been some improvements, for example, like in 2017 court case, you know, the court allowed that, you know, adult dependent, even who are older than 30 years old can apply. But this has been a kind of huge business for uh, legal industry, I think. Uh, so many of them are winning uh, cases, you know, as, a, you know, uh, is, is looked at case by case. So you have to spend so much money, go through so much hassle to win, to come to UK. So why British government doesn't look at this, that they are not going to win, you know, on the refusal cases, so they do not decide in mass. And this is this is what uh, you know something British government has to look at. Uh, I think that's that's all I got to say on this one. Do we have other questions? I think we don't have. Uh, do we have to add something? Uh, Maybe 
you you didn't get time to uh, present earlier. You want, well, yes. You want to add something? <laughs> Uh, I mean, there is, a, there is a whole set of research we carried out for the, the elderly Gurkhas. Uh, and uh, I think a couple of points to add, maybe it, will, it could be a, of interest that once, you know, Gurkhas were allowed to come to UK in 2009, in the large numbers, and it started it's still, uh, you know, new kind of the debate here in the UK because a large number of them chose to go to Aldersat. And uh, there was a, a hue and cry that, you know, the sitting MP at that time who supported first, the, you know, who voted for Gurkha first, then he came against them. And uh, a Facebook group called uh, Lomle's Legacy was uh, opened uh, to propagate against Gurkhas. Uh, to, in a way, a, a, you know, raise hatred against the elderly Gurkhas and, and the frail elderly Gurkhas, uh, you know, their dress, the sense of their dress, you know, the, the way they look, they look very foreign here. And, uh, and the, you know, they started to go to uh, town centers, they started to go to parks, you know, some kind of hatred was spread. And, uh, so Gorkha's uh, integration, their problems facing by them, you know, it's become a huge problem. This is still a huge problem, I would say, uh, because first uh, they get very basic pay uh, to survive and they try to save money to pay loan to support their elderly, sorry, adult dependents in Nepal. So they are seen in a cheap uh, vegetable stalls. Uh, they, they are not allowed to vote in the UK because unlike Commonwealth uh, citizens, you know, one disadvantage for us Nepalese, despite all the Gorkha services, is that we're not the part and parcel of the Commonwealth uh, nations. Uh, Commonwealth citizens, it is respective of their status, even if someone Indian student comes to UK, they, are, they can uh, cast the vote in local elections. We Nepalese cannot. For example, me, I'm a, a permanent resident here, but I'm not a citizen. So I haven't voted in UK. So I come to Nepal to vote. So these groups are disenfranchised lot, the large number, uh, who are not aware of what's going on around them because our survey last year, you know, we asked them about Brexit and they said, we don't know about it. All we know is about the Krishna Colonel's uh, Indrani program in Nepal. That's what we were seeing. That's, that, that's what they, 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 they did. They were not aware, aware about what's going on around, around them. All of them mostly, you know, suffering with one or other health problems. Complete lack of language. Language is the number one issue for them. So not having English language skills. Many of them are illiterate even in Nepali, more than 50% in functional terms. So their life is fully dependent on, on, on others. They don't have much to do. Uh, Apart from whenever they get this, you know, uh, being coming from the farming backgrounds, apart from what they, you know, they get the allotments, they are very successful, uh, successfully, you know, uh, done the vegetable gardening uh, whenever they get the chances. So housing, very poor housing, living with somebody and the, the garbeti not wanting them to come to their living space when they, whenever they have got a guest. And during the cold times, you know, some of them end up even are charged of the, you know, sitting on the on a bus all day uh, to warm them up uh, themselves. So this is the most disadvantaged groups in the UK, uh, and I think they need they need some dignity. They're deprived in a separation from the family in the old age. Think about losing your social connections, all the social capital you built throughout the you know your life, and now you move to UK. Because many of these people who come to UK, they are the, they are getting something paid for the first time, even if it's a benefit. Because uh, after the you know their redundancy from the Borneo War, War or something in the 1960s, they were not seen as a laureate. They were nobody, and they didn't have any regular income there. So this first time, you know, they are getting something. So they 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 felt compelled to come to come to UK. So this is this is the other parts of the you know the Gurkhas and the the, the British Safa uh, services was trying to help a little bit with the the labor money, uh, but they are in great need for support uh, uh, support. I think that's the other part of the Gurkhas. And now 
Uh, Nepali diaspora in the UK, I think basically more or less is dominated by Gurkhas and their families. They see, you know, they're reflecting it in the, in the uh, Gurkha migration. Uh, uh, otherwise, you know, these people are happily taking part in, in, in a, in a, in a, in a, big, in a, in a, in a poppy, poppy, big, big, uh, uh, what is this, this, uh, in the Remem Remembrance Days campaigns, you know, the World War II, World War II, you know, they heavily, they happily participate. They, you know, they are, you know, part and parcel of the, the uh, British life and they, I don't think they seen a, you know, as a threat, but, you know, they have been facing cases of hatred. A, you, know, a, you know, that's the situation maybe. I think I just took a little time to explain. Thank you. Thank you, Kishnajiya. Naris Magar has a question. Narasi. So do you want to ask Narasi? Okay, uh, let's read. Krishnaji. Right. Okay, okay, yeah, he's at work, so he just posted the question. Sorry. So yes, I think please. he's seen as one of the successful campaign, but during the presentation, so that how many Gurkha organizations are there? I'm just curious whether the competition between them contributed to their success. I think, uh, in a way, in a way, uh, the, you know, competition or, you know, some kind of the political division, something, uh, contributed to the survival of the Gorkha campaign, I would say. Uh, many factions, but not necessarily, you know, some of them are just in few numbers and they are not visible. Uh, they are really solid, uh, you know, some organizations, you know, in the, um, uh, who have the uh, good base and doing some, some something visible. Uh, there are only three, four organizations. Uh, they come, they come, uh, in competition to some extent, as I said that, you know, once somebody is tired and some also, you know, some of the organizations, you know, have these organizations have different interests. For example, Geso had interest, you know, to give some, some justice to the, the, the groups who were discriminated, discriminated best on, you know, their service before 1997. Uh, and they were more interested about the, the uh, settlement. Uh, and uh, uh, whereas, you know, once, I mean, they have been doing some contributing to, uh, to, to the Gurkha Satyagraha, but uh, Gyanraj and others who, who once participated in the, the, the Geso, uh, they have been now championing on the, you know, for the cause of pay and pension, also supported by you know, other, other groups. Uh, BGWS uh, did some achievement and is still continuing fighting for the, you know, more legally and otherwise uh, on the discriminations. So to me, I think, uh, you know, despite what people say that, okay, we need to be united, you know, stand together. But I don't think, uh, you know, them uh, the campaigning different uh, from the different uh, platforms also coming together at the time of the, the in a peak of the campaigns uh, has harmed their cause. Uh, maybe, you know, standing together, maybe it would be beneficial, but it not necessarily been harmful. Avasi, I want to speak. Uh, Avasi. Yeah, Avasi, please. Uh, so, um, sorry, I'm not going to do But uh, my question is um, relating, uh, has there been any issues relating to the current recruitment process uh, from the Gurkha campaign side of things? Uh, you mean issues? Do you know any issues? No, not that I have heard of, but uh, have have uh, re regarding the current recruitment that goes on, has Gurkha campaign? No, I think I think despite despite the fact that the many Gurkha organizations at times say uh, tripartite agreement is a surrender document, why Gurkhas you know have been made to fight with the countries that are not their enemies, you know all those kind of political rhetorics out there. But to me, all Gorkha organizations, I don't think they're against uh, uh, the recruitment. Uh, uh, so Gorkha Satyagra uh, last year, was it last year or 27, somewhere, sometimes, they tried to obstruct uh, recruitment of Gorkhas uh, in Nepal in order to draw attention uh, to their demands. Uh, but uh, um, they haven't continued on that one. Uh, 
Uh, I mean, there was issue about hiring uh, women uh, into British army. I mean, there was some issues in the uh, uh, from some political leaders in Nepal, but I haven't heard anything from the uh, you know, Gorkha campaign site. So I don't know. Uh, I don't. I don't think there is any. Thank you, Pratishunta wants to ask. First thing. Um, okay. Okay. Can you can you please uh, first take the question from Ms. Carpenter in chat, and then if there is time, yes, I yes. will ask my question. Yes, please, Kishanji. Right. Okay. Uh, Sue Carpenter uh, has asked, the, "Do we have the figure of the Nepalese in the UK and is still growing, made up uh, new migrants, maybe children born in the UK?" Uh, this question, I think, uh, uh, we have been trying very hard to establish the number of Nepalese. Even for that, uh, from Centre for Nepalese UK, we carried out a people's census in 2008. And we estimated the number of Nepalese in the UK to be around 70,000. The subsequent 2011 census showed that there were 62,000 Nepalese in uh, England uh, and 1,200 something in uh, uh, Scotland. Uh, I mean, when I said England, England and Wales. Uh, so that was the number. We, did, we didn't know much about the Northern Ireland. I think the number could be just 300. Uh, so, but we, took it as a kind of the massive undercount. So this year, 20, 2021, uh, uh, is, you know, the, uh, you, you, there's a census of the uh, whole UK, that's not the whole UK, England and Wales and Northern Ireland completed. Uh, so we expect, we did a you know, big campaign. We expect, the, you know, the, uh, most of the Nepalese have participated. So two numbers will come. But to me that the, Nepal, the number of Nepalese in the UK uh, should be around 100,000. We could take uh, into account, you know, all the in and outs, but we don't know the number of the children born in the UK. So this will be known, uh, you know, shown by the census. So next year, I think, will be a better position to understand this. Yes, good to say. Um, Kishanji, uh, for the last uh, 25 years, the actual number of uh, Gurkha recruits uh, who've been recruited into the, you know, in the British Army has remained uh, about 230 plus minus, you know, the, the number fluctuates a bit, but it has remained more or less around that number for, for the last 25 years. Now the various uh, groups in the UK uh, fighting for the Gurkha cause, have they made any comments on this number? I mean, we all know that, the, uh, you know, they're, they're, if, if the Brits wanted to recruit twice as many or three times as many Gurkhas, uh, every year, uh, there are plenty of people doing the doing the tests and the trials in in Pokhara and elsewhere, who, who could be eligible for that. So why has that number been uh, fixed at uh, you know roughly 230 for all these years? And do these organizations have a view on that number? Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, again. Thank you for the very good question, uh, and also uh, the the number sharing the number. Uh, I haven't. Heard much. I mean, I didn't have any knowledge uh, of the uh, uh, ex Gurkha organizations making any stand on this on these numbers. Uh, I, I mean, the, the Brit British government wanted to cut the number of uh, Gurkhas, uh, you know, recruited in British British Army. Uh, of course, out of these two hundred thirty, some go to Singapore police, uh, and they tried to do do that after two thousand eight's economic crisis, and. Uh, but uh, very recently, I said, as I said before, I think that number, I think uh, in the last uh, couple of years, they increased that number to about, uh, you know, 400 uh, to compensate uh, the shortages of recruitment uh, in the, in the, uh, from the uh, native British. Uh, they didn't have uh, enough uh, infrastructure to train uh, Gurkhas. Uh, but I think they had to make uh, extra in investment. So the, it, it was a kind of the U-turn on the part of the British government uh, to increase that number. As you, uh, the, you know, uh, know well and have written about, it's that the, the Britain in the past, you know, used to increase the number when, whenever there was war. They wanted more people and send them home when the war is, you know, is over. Uh, so, but on the question of the views from the uh, Gurkhas, uh, I haven't heard much apart from the. Uh, disappointment of 
you know, Nepali, you know, so many Nepali youths being made to carry Dogo and Ron, and also, you know, many of them, you know, just being depressed and frustrated after, you know, as only few, you know, get uh, to be recruited. So what happens to the life of others? You know, these are the questions that have been heard from time and again, but I haven't, I haven't seen any from stance or anything in written document. Thank you. Uh, Arsa, I was wondering if Avas, who, who spoke just before me, had a, had a view on this, uh, because he's been probably one of the most recent people doing research on this, or even Sanjay, if he's still on the line. Yes. Avasi, do you want to add? No, um, not that I know of. The, the, the only thing, um, the, like uh, Krishna just said, there has been a slight increase in recent years uh, because of uh, more, uh, there have been more, well, retired, I guess. But I, I haven't heard anything that, uh, and not within the recruitment circles, uh, any kind of voice that has um, have, um, asked for the increase in numbers. And there's something, I, from what I know, there's something that the British Army wants to maintain, because in some sense, it's also trying to not have a larger uh, pool of recruits, uh, because that would eventually make it much more difficult if you have to then you know, decrease the numbers. So. Uh, yeah, so I I, I, yeah, I I don't know anything in terms of the campaign raising these issues either. Thank you, Avasi. I think Dipendra Paharizi uh, raised his hand. Dipendra Ji. Uh, thank, you. thank you also, sir. And thank you, Martin Chaudhary, and a special thanks to Krishna, sir, for his insights on the issue. Uh, I'm from Pokhara, uh, the village of Lauris, I will say. So Gorkhas are known for their bravery all around the world, but this, uh, uh, you know, like continued dispute between two nations has uh, been lengthening uh, over the years and years uh, in spite of coming to a conclusion. So my question is, uh, sir, what is your opinion uh, on this issue? Like uh, how the international arena is looking on this issue? I'm afraid that because of this, Though we are known to be the brave ones, but uh, they may come, the world will look at us in a diff indifferent way. Uh, in some other issues, not only in this issue, in some other issues also, they may look at us in indifferent way. Uh, what have you found on this? Uh, thank you. I mean, if I understood your question correctly, that the, how the international arena or, or international community. Yes, sir. This one, uh, I really don't know. Uh, I don't think they care much. Uh, much. I mean, so far the Gorkhas are concerned. Uh, based on my, you know, the uh, uh, personal uh, experience, uh, many people, many people, uh, you know, tend to know about the Gorkhas, and uh, they regard them a uh, very high as a brave soldiers, and they, you know, the, the brave soldiers also is kind of a construction. Uh, uh, anyway. Uh, but as, as, as far as the international is concerned, I think the Gorkha uh, been to uh, European uh, court, court, of, uh, court of Human Rights and they lost the case there. So I am, uh, as a you know, the, you know, social scientist or the student of social science, and it's very hard uh, to, me, you know, uh, to me to understand that you know, we have heard about the positive discrimination. Yes, you can discriminate people to redress the, the, the uh, past problems to compensate or to, as a, a reparation, uh, but uh, negative discrimination to the party that is victim is very difficult to understand. But in legal terms, they say you are allowed to discriminate uh, uh, as long as you justify. So, uh, so I, I don't think I'm qualified to answer a, on the, you know, what international committee thinks. I mean, Nepal as a kind of the, you know, small country, it has very limited political clout even the, you know, the, what Nepal can uh, achieve in diplomatic ties, I think Nepal needs to take a you know, bigger stance. Uh, I don't think Nepal government uh, you know, is extremely serious, even though these last few years that you know, they have at least uh, uh, put their views. Uh, uh, so, uh, I don't know. Um, thank you. Um, I think we are running out of time. time so, do you, want, do you want to say something at the end of the program before I uh, finish this program? Uh, okay, thank you uh, to you, Harsaji, and my thank you to uh, 
Pratish Ji and all the um, team at the Martin Chautari. We have been doing this as a kind of the partnership between collaboration between Britain Nepal Academic Council and Martin Chautari. I would like to I like this uh, you know lecture series to flourish and maybe we can have speakers from Nepal too. And I appreciate all the hard work you have done uh, for this and also for the time today. Thank you. Thank, yeah, thank you. Now I want to uh, end this program. Thank you very much for coming. Okay.